10 to 15 billion dollars are lost in government revenue every year because of illegal logging. That's a lot of money and it indicates that illegal logging remains a major challenge for forest governance worldwide. So why genes, drones and satellites? It's because we at WRI are working on catalyzing the development of a set of technologies to help detect illegal logging and to help prevent it in the future. Timber legality regulations in the EU, US, and Australia have significantly raised the bar for due diligence and due care in the forest products industry. But environmental groups and government agencies keep finding instances of illegal timber entering these same markets. So these regulations alone are not enough. That's why we at WRI are working on these technologies to move this ahead. We think that by developing these technologies, you can make it easier for government enforcement agencies to detect illegal timber, but you can also make it cheaper and easier for the private sector to comply with these regulations in the first place. So what is our role in this? We're a think tank. We don't develop technologies. We see ourselves as a facilitator. We work to bring together developers with potential user communities like governments, the private sector, and civil society to find out how these technologies work, how they can be improved, and how they can be made cost effective. Forest product supply chains are vulnerable. Paper-based systems are easily falsified, and misdeclaration of both species and origin remains a big problem. WRI commissioned a study based on a secret shopper analysis for one specific processing chain, which showed that, well, the findings seem to indicate, let's put it that way, that misdeclaration remains a major problem for wide sectors, for, for wide component of the industry. Um, species and origin were frequently mislabeled, even in those supply chains where retailers had taken great care on verifying where their timber supply came from. So that's where these technologies come in. Today, I'm going to briefly talk about two umbrellas of technologies. The first is what we call technologies for identifying wood, and the second is what we call perimeter defense. Those are technologies that are used to detect instances of illegal logging in the forest and hopefully to prevent them in the future. Let's start by talking about wood identification. I will walk you through this decision tree quickly so you can see which technology is applicable for which question. And the key thing to think about is what are the benefits and what are the potential limitations of each of these technologies. Wood has chemical and physical structures that allow you to run a number of analyses to get some indication of where it came from and what it is. So if you're looking at wood as opposed to paper and pulp products and you want to know what is this, what is this piece of wood, you have a few options. You can use wood, anat uh, wood anatomy, uh, you can also look at DNA analysis, and there's two kinds of newer chemical compound analyses that are being developed right now that will be able to help you identify the species or genus in the future. If you're looking to find out where something is from, then you again can go to DNA, but you can also go to something called stable isotope analysis. And again, these two newer types of chemical compound analysis that are coming online. Paper, as opposed to wood, is a highly processed product. Paper, uh, in making paper, you break down a lot of the physical and chemical structures that allow you to identify wood in the first place. So your only option is really to look at the fibers in fiber analysis. However, in all these technologies, the key takeaway is that you need reliable and well-developed reference libraries for the specific geography and the species you're looking at, because otherwise your data will not be able to answer your question. Starting with DNA, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because the next speaker will go into it in more detail. But DNA analysis at the most basic level is a comparison of DNA sequences from a sample to a reference. You have to identify a marker and you have to compare the same marker across the sample and the reference. 
There's three main challenges in applying DNA analysis to timber. The first is that it's very difficult to extract DNA from wood as opposed to live matter, such as leaves. The second challenge is that you have to get a certain quantity of high-quality DNA in order to be able to run these tests. And the third challenge, again, goes back to the reference libraries. You need a comprehensive, high-quality reference library to compare your data to. Next up is mass spectrometry. This is an analysis used to identify stable isotopes and other chemical compounds in a range of different products. Wood is only one of them. It's frequently used in the food sector, in agricultural products, in animal products, and it's been around for a while. But it's a destructive analysis. To analyze stable isotopes, you combust the sample, so you lose your product, uh, and you run it through this machine here. And what you end up is, is ratios of specific stable isotopes, and that tells you something for your origin. Newer versions of mass spectrometry are coming online that are not destructive, so you don't need to combust a sample. There's less sample preparation involved, which makes it easier and cheaper to use. The US Customs and Border Protection Agency has installed three of these newer devices in ports in the United States. Now scientists are working to apply this technology to timber as well. One of them is called Ed Espinosa. He's based at the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And he recently published a paper in a peer-reviewed journal showing that he can use this newer chemical compound analysis to identify species of Dalbergia. Again, the same problem remains that you need to develop the reference libraries for the specific types of analysis. The analysis of anatomical features within wood has been around for a long time. It's one of the most basic and most reliable technologies for identifying the genus and in some cases the species of a wood sample. However, you need to have many years of experience to be able to use this reliably. So scientists at the US Forest Products Lab at the Forest Service have developed a little handheld scanner that can read the anatomical structure from wood and match it to an online reference database. So basically, it's like fingerprinting or facial recognition technology, but applied to wood. The device exists, and it works, but it's finicky. It needs to be calibrated. So there needs to be some improvements in the actual device. At the same time, we have the same problem of reference libraries that have to be developed for this to become more widely applicable. Finally, as I mentioned before, paper fiber analysis is really the only option if you want to know what your paper consists of. To do this, you expose the sample to a number of chemicals. You observe the reactions in the fibers, and then that tells you something about what it is. You can maybe tell, depending on the quality of the fiber, if it's hardwoods or softwoods. You can tell if it's chemically or mechanically pulped. And in some cases, you can tell the genus, and apparently in some cases, even the species of the fibers involved. That concludes the part of talking about the wood identification technologies. Let's move on now to talk about the second umbrella of perimeter defense. This is a set of technologies developed to deal with three challenges. The first is logging companies logging outside their concession areas. The second is outsiders encroaching into protected areas. And the third is that in many cases, forest managers have very few resources to manage vast amounts of areas. And it's difficult for them to put people on the ground or use staff effectively in terms of protecting their boundaries. So there's three kinds of technologies I'd like to talk about today. The first one is smartphone-based sensors. There is an initiative called Rainforest Connection. They're based in the Bay Area in the US. And they've piloted the system in Indonesia. They're now working on scaling it up. This is a smartphone that they repurpose as a listening device. They equip the smartphone with solar panels, and they hang them high up in trees. And then when the, sol when the, when the smartphone picks up the sound of logging equipment, so chainsaws and logging trucks, it sends a signal to local enforcement agents or to local communities via satellite. This allows the local community to go check out immediately what's happening and find out if there is actually an instance of illegal logging happening. 
satellite power and satellite remote sensing technology has made dramatic improvements over the past years. And a number of different developers are looking at these technologies to help them develop new applications. There is an institution called Transparent World. They are using high resolution satellite data to identify selective logging in forest areas. They use high resolution satellite data in conjunction with contextual information such as management plans, protected area boundaries, et cetera. And they've used this successfully in Laos. Another way of using satellite data is the WRI initiative Global Forest Watch, which some of you might be familiar with. They, uh, this is based on a partnership between the World Resources Institute, Google, the University of Maryland, and 60 other partners that provides near real-time information about tree cover extent and tree cover loss worldwide. This image shows you an example of tree cover extent and loss in the Mekong Basin from 2000 to 2014. It shows you that from 2009 onwards, there's a rapid increase in tree cover loss based on this data. Finally, a number of developers are looking to handheld devices using citizen science and crowdsourcing to help detect illegal logging. One of these, a WRI partner, is called Extreme Citizen Science, or Excites. They work with logging companies and local communities in the Congo Basin to develop non-text-based applications to help people that don't read or write very well uh, to map and protect their resources. They can map timber, non-timber forest products, they can put in boundaries, and then they can use their cheap and easy to use cell phones to indicate if there has been an instance of encroachment. Another initiative is called TIMBI. This is my backyard is what that stands for. They're based in Liberia. They're developing a reporting app for people to submit information about instances of illegal logging. That can be both videos, pictures, or sound recordings to their platform. The platform incorporates this evidence with mapping software, and Timby then works to raise the profile of these cases and raise awareness about these instances of illegal logging internationally. That's it for the technologies I wanted to mention today. We're excited about these technologies at WRI. We want to make them work, but we also realize that there's a significant amount of challenges ahead. The first and foremost is what I mentioned earlier. For all the technologies to use to identify wood, there uh, need to be global reference databases, and there needs to be a coordinated public investment to make that happen, because it's expensive, and it takes a lot of planning. There are bits and pieces here and there, and some of the technologies have more data available now than others, but there needs to be a coordinated global response. Then what we've noticed also is that for some of these technologies, there is limited commercial lab capacity. Some of these technologies are developed in government labs or at universities, and these are not ideally set up to serve as service providers. They can't handle a huge amount of samples. They can't process them in timely fashion. That's not really their job. So developing commercial capacity for running these analyses is another challenge. They're also at different stages of implementation. Some of them already work in the field. Others need to be tested. Do they work under canopy cover? Do they work in the rain? Do they work without a constant supply of electricity? Are they functional? Do they correspond to the user needs? And finally, once they're at the point of working, they need to be scaled up. And that's going to depend in a large part on whether a business case can be made for their use, both in the private sector and for government enforcement agencies. So what's next? WRI is going to host a series of what we call technology summits over the next year that deals with this different batch of technologies each time and it aims to bring together the developers and scientists with the potential user communities from government, NGOs, private companies to talk about how are these technologies working now and what needs to happen for them to become useful and actively implemented. The, next, the first one is next week in San Francisco. Uh, it's going to focus on the perimeter defense bucket that we talked about earlier. And if you're interested in becoming involved, please let us know. If you want to learn more about these technologies, I've included some references, and I'm happy to share this with you because I know it's a very small type. You can get in touch with me on this email. Uh, you can also find any of the WRI team at this event. And I encourage you, if you're interested in this topic, to come to the side event tomorrow at 12.45 p.m. on upscaling the global timber tracking network, which is precisely the kind of public 
coordination effort to deal with the reference libraries and technology implementation for the wood identification bucket. Thank you very much. Thank you.